It's day 42 and we are now in Panama and within reach of the southernmost point you can drive in North America. It's almost sunset and we have come up to our worst nightmare, a locked gate on what is most likely private property. Well, we've made it as far as we can. I mean, obviously we can't go further because the gates are locked. Of course, we're literally over that hill. Over that hill is the edge of the continent. And through this gate is the end of the continent. So hopefully somebody will come in and let us through it and let us camp over there tonight. There's a guy coming up the road and hopefully he'll be able to help us or he'll kick us out one or the other. It's gonna go down exactly one of two ways. So we uh, are getting some intel from this local guy and as he drove by, I noticed in the back of his truck, he's got a big fish tote. Our goal is to get to the southernmost point of Panama, which you have to get to by water. So right away, it's like, this is our guy. He's got a boat. We got to get there. I don't speak Spanish, so thankfully Kurt can do that. And it uh, looks like he's our ticket. So I think we're good. Yeah, I hope, think we're going to get to it. Our Fingers crossed. Yeah. Can, we, can we follow you? You show us the playa? The playa, Spian? Yeah, well, I guess we're, we're turning around. If this works out, he lives even further south than the spot we were hoping to get. So I don't know if we have to walk there or how we have to get there, but for a few dollars in gasoline, he said, he'll let us camp there. So now we got to do another uh, Austin Powers turn here. No longer behind the locked gate. We're on the, the good side of a locked gate. Jeff, I think you're spot on. He's a fisherman. Um, maybe he'd be willing to be a boat to take us to that point. Uh, we'll give him some gasoline and maybe a little bit of money to help us out for the day to pay, pay for his time. And we're going to get out there, so let's go check it out. I'm pretty excited about this. Through the jungle, a lonely beach comes into view. We have reached the very southern point in which you can drive in North America. Wow! How beautiful is this? I mean, you get to, it's all of this behind four gates, the first of which is being is locked. So it's only locals that see this. Is that this, the end of the road? This yeah, is the, this is amazing. This is the best beach we've been to yet. Oh yeah. Hands down. This is the farthest south you can drive. So from Tuktoyaktuk or Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, all the way down the, North, the uh, North American continent to this point. And when you touch that water, we have gone from the Arctic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> as far as north and south as you can go. This is awesome. Scott said it best about this place, that it just seems untouched and pure. So it was two years ago now. We stood at the Arctic Ocean and I was walking down the rocks, just like the rocks here, thinking about life choices and where I'm going to go, what I'm going to do. Two years later, I'm standing here on these rocks, thousands and thousands of miles away, thinking about my next steps in life, life choices. You know, having gotten married and stepped into new chapters with the same group of people. It's crazy how life goes by and changes and you go through experiences and you grow and you stay with these people and you live life with people and you see the world together and uh, I mean that's the heart behind what we do. This moment right now is what overlanding is all about. We, we woke up this morning and we just had a general direction of where we were going to go and we knew that we were pushing south, we knew we were coming to this region and we discovered this amazing little cove on the beach of the southernmost point uh, of North America. Coming to a point like here, I'm looking forward 20, 30 years from now, I'll be able to point this out to my kids and be like, I was here, this is the story of how you got here. And that's, that's really exciting because it kind of leaves behind legacy you know like you hear about those grandfathers that have like the craziest stories and how they got to this place to that place and to kind of look back and be like man I'm kind of I'm kind of living that life right now and for me and my wife Molly we don't see ourselves stopping you know that's 
kind of what we want to go after is keep finding those adventures and keep pursuing those things. And it's been quite a journey in a bunch of different aspects. It's been great doing this with the team we have. We've really become family. These are relationships that are a lifetime. I think that's the most important thing that's come out of all of this. Yeah, look at this. We're in the freaking southernmost point on the beach. Ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> this location has been experienced by only a few, and it possesses the sense of a forgotten frontier. The southern geographic point of the continent is just two and a half miles to the southeast, and we will have to take a boat to reach it. That boat is to be provided through the local fishermen that led us through the gate last night, who should be arriving in camp any minute now. Tango French toast? Tango French toast? It's bien with celery. See? Ah, those are done. Cambio. And then, uh, do they want some syrup for their toast? Show, show, show. Good, huh? Yeah. inaccessible by land and it's this rock right over here to our left. We did it. We set it out. It was our goal. And here we are. The southernmost point in North America. I just like to think about the randomness of everything like the divine how everything just fell together and how we get to be here at this moment right now. It's pretty cool. But I'm really just engrossed by the power of these two things that collide. You know we have this mass of water and the end of a continent and they just crush into each other it's just amazing and how many people get to be at this point right here witnessing that it's just a cool cool experience it's a special place it's just i, I don't even know how to describe it when it comes to the expedition i would say that this moment is the highlight of my trip I think that many of the other guys would say so too. You can dry them by a lighter, it works really well. <laughs> you know, and sometimes an extra jerry of gas gets you on a boat ride. 
following an expedition overland tradition, I hand over our expedition patch to our guides because they have significantly impacted our trip. Today was awesome. We got up really early. Everyone's up at six. We got that boat ride. Those guys we met was just incredible. Such a such an awesome time to just randomly meet up with them and go out. Packed up and now we're headed to Panama City. It's a six-hour drive, so we're gonna make a hard push now and get there in time to set up. Be good for tonight. On our way out, we are able to take in the magnificent road that got us in here, and our thoughts begin to wander to what's ahead. We are about to cross over one of several recognized geographic lines between North America and geographic South America. It's another expedition overland first of entering a new continent. The Bridge of the Americas. This is the Panama Canal that we're going over right now. And this is the boundary line between North America and technically South America. The water barrier between the two continents now. So this is known as the Bridge of the Americas. We are to meet up with Dan Smith, an American living in Panama for about the last 50 years. We are going to base out of his compound for a couple days. Dan Smith. Dan Smith. Dan, pleased to meet you. I'm Steve. Hey, good. Well, we're only uh, five minutes out right now. Well, let's go. So this is hilarious. This is exactly what I pictured. He told me he lived in two shipping containers yeah. in the yard. Uh, when was this built? Uh, I'm not sure when he built it. Uh, probably 35 years ago. Big kitchen. This is oh, awesome. This is so cool. And there's a shower stall that has two showers. Do you want to take showers together? You can. <laughs> I first came down here in 1962. And, uh, I retired here. I went into precious metals. Mm. And uh, that's how I got to know the Dairy Inn, buying gold from the Indians. Drug dealers decided to use that for money laundering, so I got out of that and went into furniture business. And since then, I. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, working archaeology and hunting for treasure and stuff like that. Besides a man looking for lost treasure, he himself has been a part of some significant history. He was stationed out of Panama in the early 60s, and since he was born in Cuba, was recruited into a special unit formed by the CIA that secretly entered Cuba to train up a rebel force that would hopefully assist in taking down the growing communist Cuban government led by Fidel Castro in what is now known as the failed invasion of the Bay of Pigs. He is a self-taught scholar of the time when Panama was the New World. He wanted to take us to some of Panama's most significant historical areas and places that he has been exploring for some Beautiful. years now. You found these? Not all of these. Uh, this one I bought in a pawn shop. <laughs> <laughs> we poured over maps for the better part of an hour before deciding to head north to the area once known as Panama's Golden Triangle. The earlier we can get out of here, the better. Because uh, two hours out, two and a half hours out, is the town of Torti. The Golden Triangle was compiled of the travel routes used to move the Spanish gold toward the ports. It was the epicenter of the New World's economic boom. It consequently became the focus of the pirate world. The privateer Captain Henry Morgan raided this port as well as the British-employed privateer, Captain Drake, who sacked many Spanish ships and ports throughout this area, stealing millions of dollars of Spain's precious metal and eventually disabling this particular port altogether. Captain Drake's heart is supposedly buried on this island at the entrance to the port of Portobello. After living for years on the high seas, he simply died of dysentery. Dan has spent much of his life piecing back together this area's lost history. 
he pulled this very cannon from a shipwreck he found not too far from here. And this one, we traced back to the archive in the Indies by this number. Yeah. This was sort of an inventory number on the ship. You know, silver bars being stacked up in the streets like corn. Yeah. And uh, when the fleet came in, they would be 15, 18 ships, and they would load them up with gold and silver. Wow. And uh, a lot of them didn't make it. The first thing that just kind of popped in my head was like the Pirates of the Caribbean and it just what it was like being here in the day and just the fight, the sheer firepower if this thing was under siege that came out of here. Just, I mean, there's probably 30 cannons sitting right here and each one of those are just banging off, just hitting ships out here in the port. And it would have just been amazing and really cool to see and experience that just even if it was from, you know, the streets outside the walls here. So just behind me over here is a church with a statue known as the Black Christ. Apparently several times people tried to steal it and send it out of here. One time the ship did get out with it, but then it sank and the statue floated back to shore. So now it's still in there, it's still in the church. Apparently it's just not supposed to leave here. Just chilling, hanging out on a cannon from an old fort. Boom, boom. Dan now takes us to another town down the way and gives us a shot at finding our own treasure. Nombre de Dios. Right, this is the old town of Nombre de Dios here. If you look down, you see pottery all over. Uh, a lot of that is uh, roofing tile, but there's some of it which is uh, pottery, and we'll see a lot more of it out here. So this is, this is what, what's the age on this guy, you think? Uh, 450, 500 years. 500 years, and that mm -hmm. is still legible art from the time. Yeah. Uh -huh. The desire for that treasure gets inside of you and it's possible like a coin could be in there. And that's like what keeps you going. It's kind of just like this treasure hunting desire for more gold. Doesn't take long before a few local boys come to see us. We take our leave back to Dan's compound in Panama City. We are heading down to the Darien Gap, which is a dream come true, come true for several of us. This guy won't stop talking about the Darien Gap at all. I've been thinking about the Darien Gap for a long time as well, ever since I heard about the Land Rover guys going across it way back when, and seeing those pictures. And, and you don't just get into the Darien Gap either. Like today we're gonna be using Dan, thankfully, to talk to the minister of the area, who's then gonna call ahead and talk to the uh, head of police that's down in Yavitz at the end of the road and hopefully we get an, a police escort through there and maybe be able to camp inside the police compound. On a previous attempt tried to make it all the way down and we're stopped just short because really we said well we're tourists and they said there's no reason for tourists to be in Yavitz today there had been some drug activity so they turned us around at a military checkpoint yeah. so with Dan fortunately he's made those connections ahead of time we're uh, fingers crossed we breeze right through the checkpoints and get down to the Yaviza, which is the final town on the road, and maybe even a little bit further. Today, the Darien Gap is a red zone. The Colombian conflict of the 90s flared up rebel groups in the area, most notably the FARC, an anti-government rebel group responsible for 60% of America's cocaine traffic. This is a highly dangerous area to be in. Just two weeks after we were here, the Cinefront Special Forces Unit engaged the FARC in one of its fiercest battles, killing many FARC rebels in an open assault. Major Barroso is not, not there today. He's up in Panama. So, uh, and there's a lieutenant, but he's not there right now either. So oh, I told no. him, I said, we'll, we'll coordinate with the Comisionado and Metete. He said, great, great, do that. Okay. So, Here we are, as you can see, we're at the sign for the Welcome to the Darien. This is the uh, Darien province, which is the furthest province in Panama towards South America. Uh, as we continue, we're about 60 miles roughly out of Yavisa, which is the end of the Pan American Highway as we know it. Uh, without that, furthermore, you've got to blast through the Darien Gap, so we're hoping to get down there, maybe 
maybe step toes in the gap a little bit, but Yaviza is surrounded by what is known as the Darien Gap. I mean, the, the greater area, both sides, uh, east, west, north, south, is kind of one big gap area, uh, 50 miles wide, about 90 miles high. Uh, there's a lot of obstacles to the Darien Gap. On the Panamanian side, you've got the, the mountains, so you'd have to cross the mountains that are pretty thick vegetation and jungles, so it require quite a bit of bushwhacking. Now, vehicle groups have gone through before, starting in 1960, 72, and again in the 80s and 90s, groups made it through, but that the vegetation grows over so quickly, the trail's all been lost, if not completely lost. More troubling than the vegetation that you'd have to fight through to get through the uh, Darien Gap is the swamps, uh, which would require putting them on a boat of some variety to cross some of those river crossings. Then, you push further south, the biggest uh, com you know, opponent's gonna be the, the FARC themselves, which is a Colombian re uh, rebel militant group that's uh, known for taking, they've taken over that area and use that as a hotbed of uh, a place to transport drugs through the continent. They use both the seaside and the mainland, and when the Panamanian government, the center front, which is the anti-narco group down here, when they put more pressure on the ocean side and the rivers using boats, it pushes that, uh, that drug trafficking mainland, and they'll use the local villagers as porters and guides to transport drugs to the center. And when that lightens up, then they go back to the using the rivers and streams. So at no time is it really safe to be down there without a military escort. And the center front is the group that would do that if you were able to make a, an entry into the Darien Gap proper further south than Ibiza. We will have to make our way through several checkpoints. We are asked to provide the most complete and detailed records of our personnel as possible. You know you're in tough country when you're asked for your blood type. O positive. We are not issued our military police escort, but they do allow us to make our way to each individual checkpoint, and one by one, the end of the road is within reach. End of the continent, huge storm rolling in going into <laughs> drug country. What are we doing? <laughs> the guys even from E7 couldn't get in here. Really? Yeah. They couldn't make it past that right there. They've gone all over the world and everything and they couldn't get in here and Dan got us in here. Damn. This is really special that we're in here. It's a big deal. People get in, but you might just get turned around right there too, just depending on the day. Yeah. So pretty fortunate to be in here right now. daunting feeling. We know that at the end of this is the end. It's just kind of the whole feeling right now is kind of heavy, but full of adventure. The rain moves in and hits us harder than any rain we have seen before. It's kind of neat. I don't have to see how it fucks it down. We move past several military vehicles. Helicopters fly overhead, and soon we close in on the end of the road. To be in the same vehicle we touched Prudhoe Bay with, and then now have concluded this part of the Pan American Highway with. It feels pretty good. I'm hoping every guy here feels a big sense of accomplishment because we have accomplished something that not very many people can say they've done. You can see the mist of the river and the river is, you can't go any further. You need a ferry to get over it. So I'm looking forward to touching the end of the road right up here. Entering Yavisa is surreal and has the flair of an African town. While the guys park, Dan and I make our way to the military headquarters for our final check-in. There's this guard compound. I think it's down here. Don't take pictures right now. So here we are in Uvisa, we're kind of just checking out town, walking the back streets and soaking it all up. And we've spotted the ferry on the opposite side of the river and we're hoping we can uh, get on that for tomorrow. Be able to drive our vehicles on the other side a short distance and see how far we are, we are able to drive. 
Perfect. They're going to put people with us. If anybody has any problems or anything, uh, let me know. I've got his, I've got the desk sergeant's number. We can call, and he says all night long they have people patrol. We've returned to the area in which we are told to be, and the gate is locked behind us. Normally, tourists are not allowed out of the town, but he said we could probably make an exception. <laughs> okay. Wow. We want to go do a lot of stuff if we could, but we, we need to realize that we're like on the very edge of the drug war. Like this is the drug war happening right here. And when we went to the security place, I mean, I had to put my cameras away, I had to do all that. I had to register all of our names, all of our vehicles, etc. And you can tell this place is locked down. So if we get any further on this river, it's, it's gonna be a, a blessing. A ferry comes up the way, the last boat on the water before the 5 p.m. curfew. This ferry is the very ferry that will take you into the Darien Gap. If that would be possible, this guy from the United said, yeah, he said, you, you can make it on the, on the vehicles. Really? This behind us is the vehicle ferry we right here. That right just had vehicles on it. Yeah. Oh, we got to do it. it yeah, looks Alex so spelled cool. these. That thing looks like some out of Waterworld. Waterworld. <laughs> yes, that's what I was thinking. We strike up a conversation with the ferry captain to see what our options are, and he makes a hasty call back to the main military office. The call results in some new special permissions that supersede what the Yavitsa headquarters has Hello, ordered us to do. He says he doesn't see any problem with uh, getting on a pedal when filming the, the town and so forth, which was the original thing. I, I really think that you're pushing the envelope a little bit far. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, you're yeah, sort of putting him on a spot. Sure, sure. Well, we'll and I don't want to okay. agree okay. anything with him jumping over the head of the guy here. It's all very tempting because if we put our wheels into the Daring Gap, we will be the first official expedition, or at least to the best of our knowledge, to do so in 20 years. He's trying to force it, you know, through higher ups, which is going to be jumping over these guys here. It'll cost you $400 for the day. That's for the ferry. Now this other guy charges to go through his farm over there. Um, quite frankly, I don't like the arrangement. I don't know. Uh, it's up to you all, but uh, you know, agreed to certain things with the local sure, people sure. and we should stay under their control and not try to jump over them. It's, it's because they're going to think that, that we Went over. weren't satisfied with what they did for us and went over their heads. Okay. It's a decision Clay needs to make and uh, we'll mull it over and see what uh, what comes of it. Okay. Okay. I was filming over there when they were talking and listening to all the information come through on what it would take for us to get on that ferry and go down there. Supposedly we'd have to leave at 5.30 in the morning. We would be going over the local police here because he called the commissioner, the ferry driver, called the commissioner, which means that they have a deal put together somehow. We wouldn't be able to get back until 5.30 tomorrow. We also leave the security of the city and the, the police here. If one of our vehicles or something got captured, we'd be in a ton of trouble. And then they also stated that when we got back, if we did it, uh, they would have to thoroughly go through all of our vehicles, sure. completely unload all of our vehicles. Uh, take them apart. But we could do it. They said we could do it. But that supersedes what we've uh, initially set up with the locals here. And they, they kind of really hold the ball here because they're the boots on the ground. So my decision is we will not do it. It's just not there. And uh, we, I really... I know Scott feels this way too, and all of us, we've always gone into these these different places with the blessing of the people. And you never go further if you don't have the blessing of the people. And if you're starting to leapfrog the guys that are gonna give you security from a guy that's in an office 30 miles away, it's it's just, it's not smart. Would it be epic and cool to get our, our forerunners on that and get them into the Darien Gap? Yeah, it would. The cost is just way too high. And that is what makes the Darien Gap the Darien Gap. We hit it. We came up against what makes the Darien Gap the Darien Gap. Yep. And we, we've gone as far as you possibly can. 
but like Kurt said, there's always further. You can always go further. And we went really, really far. We went as far as we could. We had blessing to get to this part. They even have given us a blessing to get on a boat in the morning and drive around the village with, you know, some security or whatever to that degree. But nothing further, you just say no. You just say no. I can't, I can't supersede that. You can't go outside the blessing of the people that are really in charge. So I'm completely happy with it. I'm ready for a steak sort of dinner out of the back of the Forerunner, parked in behind the wire in Yavitz with a posted drug guard. Yeah, I'm good. The next morning, we take advantage of our river canoe permission to see the town from the water. Well, oh, okay. No kidding. All right. Who's gonna do that little move he's doing? Everyone. Hey guys. Hi. All right. Welcome to Disneyland. On this log ride, <laughs> keep all your arms. Please keep your arms and legs inside the vessel at all times. We're heading out on the Rio Hunake, which is on the edge of Yavisa and separates Yavisa from the other half of town and the Daring Gap. So. Uh, we're now on the river that stops all vehicles from heading south. The highway comes into Yavisa, which is a small town, but there is definitely a town there. And then uh, you gotta take a ferry or get on a boat to cross the river. There is a small footbridge. Perhaps a motorcycle could get across different vehicles. Gotta go by boat or wait till the river's low enough and they can't ford it in the drier season. This, in effect, is a special gift from the local people. We are possibly the first crew in many years to film here, and potentially the first ever to fly a camera over this conflicted area. There is only one last thing to do, to step foot into the Darien Gap itself. So we cross the bridge together for the final moments of the expedition. It's a highly emotional time for us. We have accomplished so much together. We have earned every country, worked for every mile. It's very rewarding, and I'm, I'm proud of the team. I'm proud of myself. If you follow your dreams, you really can get it done. Don't always know exactly what's in store for Expedition Overland, but what I'm pretty sure of, I guess, right now is that it will go on, and we have the whole world to go around. So many little uh, micro-adventures in this much grander adventure. I don't know that I'll ever be able to repeat such a cool adventure. This has been uh, certainly a unique uh, opportunity to be able to join the team and come do this. I'm thankful for that. Look forward to future adventures. There's just always more to see, and more to do. But I'm sure all of us will be planning in our heads of how we can make this happen. A lot of times for us, it felt like we were just running into dead ends. Well, if you push beyond that, then you'll find like that better, better experience. All the experiences that I have, I will apply those to my life my marriage, my friendships, and hopefully become a better person. We came together during tough times and we were all tired and we, 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 we pushed on and we did it and we got here. But there's more to do. I'm just wanting more. This trip has been something entirely different than anything I've done before. I'm excited to go home and see my kids, see and see Rhonda. To me, that is the ending of the trip, is actually processing through the full trip and the full extent of everything that we just did. All right, there it is. The Expedition Machete. What an adventure, it's been fun. Now I gotta turn around with Kyle and Jeff. We drive these trucks all the way home. Could be another adventure in itself. There's a saying that says, while at home you dream of adventure, and when on adventure, 
you dream of home. So we're just about to leave and uh, go pick up Rochelle from the airport. But uh, what Kyle doesn't know, we've surprised him with his wife flying into Panama. Yeah, I've missed her more on this trip than I can remember missing before. It's like, as, you, as you've been married longer and everything, mm -hmm. for me, I have been missing her more and more and more. The camera's in my way. In the truck. Just kidding. I found something I think that belongs to you. Your wife sent it with me to get to you. The people we have met and the places we have seen have made a defining impact on each of us. It's amazing how the people you spend time with shape you, and if you let the places you see change your perspectives, then your world will become a better one. Being home now, our dreams have turned back toward adventure. Wanderlust is setting in and the cycle continues. We can never be sure of what's around the corner. However, there are things left unfinished. I tried to find you, but I can't see the 